60 miles off the coast of Japan, an American carrier force slang at units of the Japanese fleet is attacked by land-based enemy dive bombers. Here in the inland sea is the prelude of an epic of United States Navy warfare. Enemy losses are heavy. No serious damage has been done to our task force. Suddenly, the carrier USS Franklin is struck square amidships by two bombs from a low-diving Japanese bomber. Fully loaded planes on deck burst into flame. Bombs, rockets, and gun ammunition explode, turning the ship into a raging inferno. Without panic, crewmen fight the fires. Only superhuman bravery can save the Franklin, but her men fight on. casualties grows as explosions continue. The Franklin burns through the day. <laughs> Chaplain Father Joseph O'Callaghan, battling heroically to save lives, cares for a critically wounded sailor. Franklin is still afloat. No ship has ever before taken such punishment and survived. Scorched and bomb torn, the carrier lies dead in the water, listing sharply. Rescue ships, without regard to their own danger, stand by to take off the wounded. 1,100 are casualties, more than 800 of these killed or missing. But 2,000 others of the Franklin's crew miraculously escape unhurt. torn flag of the Franklin still flies as under her own power again she heads for a home port. Chaplain O'Callaghan celebrates religious services aboard as the Franklin limps across the Pacific. Entering the Panama Canal in the final stretch of her incredible 12,000-mile voyage, the Franklin's wounded receive combat decorations. The crew of the Franklin who brought her through safely, heroes all. The ship that the Japanese had announced that they had sunk is now home in New York for complete repairs. The Franklin's successful battle to survive now takes its place in naval history, and she will sail forth to battle once again. The German submarine scourge is ended. 
the United States Navy begins a cleanup job in American waters, where Nazi U-boats lurked until the very end of the war. Off Cape May, New Jersey, the U-858 surrenders. Navy escort vessels pull alongside. An American prize crew mans the 240-foot craft, searching for weapons. These Germans boasted they had sunk 16 Allied ships. Next day, off Portsmouth, New Hampshire, a second underseas raider gives up. This U-boat was credited with a speed of 20 knots, a cruising range of 10,000 miles. The crew disembarks, headed for a prisoner of war camp. The Atlantic is cleared of the U-boat menace. Allied officers inside the shattered city of Berlin, metropolis of a Nazi empire that once held sway over almost all of Europe. These first pictures from Berlin since the Allies entered show the crumbled ruins of the once great German citadel. Hitler's Reich Chancellery was the nerve center of the infamous Nazi regime. The Hotel Adlon stands empty and devastated, and that proud symbol of Berlin, the Brandenburg Gate, now rises above a city of ghosts. To Standel Airport, Berlin, come Air Chief Marshal Tedder, Eisenhower deputy, and General Karl Spatz, United States Air Force's commander, meeting Soviet Russia's delegation for ratification of the unconditional surrender of Germany. By plane comes Field Marshal Keitel, German commander. A German army school building is the scene of the formal ratification, confirming the previous unconditional surrender at Reims, France. General Delatre de Tassigny represents France. Marshal Ivan Zukov, conqueror of Berlin, second in command to Marshal Stalin, leads the Allied delegates to their places beneath the flags of the Allies. Zukov, hero of the Soviet Union, had been mightily aided by Allied power under Tedder and Spatz. Marshal Keitel, the image of Prussian militarism, leads his companions. Among them, General Admiral von Friedeberg, right, and General Stumpf, left. Keitel signs. The unconditional defeat of Germany is complete. representative sign. A war that was fought in unity among the Allied powers ends as well in unity. To each nation that helped smash Germany, a full share of honor in the glorious victory.